That is absolutely great. I appreciate you guys singing and being happy about singing for the Lord. You know, we like seeing you excited about that. So this morning, I want to ask you something that uh, you probably are doing, but you don't even know that you're doing it. But as you get older, you're going to realize this is going to happen to you. Has anybody in here um, ever been on a mission to do something? What, what have you been on a mission to do? I can't see. That's a good mission. You've been on a mission to clean your room. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Just, just like getting ready for church this morning. You were able to get up and, and uh, you had to have breakfast. You had to brush your teeth. You had to put your clothes on. You had to put your shoes on. So you're on a mission to do something. It means that you have these things that you need to accomplish in order uh, to accomplish the big thing. And you'll realize, listen, as you get older, as you get older and you get to be one of the old people like you see sitting out here, we are bad to get on mission to do something. Has anybody here ever been on a mission to do something? You can say, I had to get this done and this done and this done. Listen, it's easy to do. And sometimes when we get on mission to do things for ourselves, let's just say whether it's cleaning our room or whether it's uh, going to work and we want to we wanna do something as far as work goes or, or maybe it's just as you get older and you're saying, okay, I've got homework to do and I've got to do that homework so that I can pass this class so I can go to the next one, so I can go to school, so I can get an education, so I can get a job and get a job and make money and, and be able to make money and buy things. Like you don't even think about that yet, but that's your mission that you get to going on. How many people have found yourself in the middle of that mission? Anybody out here? And, and you get... Some of them, some of them are not alive. Some of them are not doing anything, right? You're just complacent. Is everybody's hand work out here? Everybody? All right. Anybody on that mission? The kids are watching. Thank you. Appreciate that. Listen, these are your examples you're looking to out here. They're on mission. Listen, I get on mission. Sometimes I look at my daily planner where I write all my stuff down, and I think, I've got to do this by 8 o'clock, and I've got to do this by 9 o'clock, and I've got to do this. So you get on a mission. But do you know who you're supposed to be on mission to Anybody know who you're supposed to be on mission to? You're supposed to be on mission to God. Now you see, there's nothing wrong with having all these other missions, but God wants us to be on mission to Him. He wants us to be doing things for Him. And while we're on mission for Him, yes, we do other things, but to to be on mission for God means that you're continually doing something that He wants you to do. Now, what are some things that God wants you to do? Anybody? All right, Macy. He wants you to what? He does want you to be healthy. What else? Mackenzie? He wants you to pray. What else, Michaela? He wants you to obey him. How would you know what to obey? Tells you in the Bible, so you'd need to do what? Read your Bible. Where else are you going to learn what God wants you to do? What would you need to do uh, to be on mission for him? What would you need to do? Exactly. Pray and read the Bible. And Max? Yeah, yeah. What else? Yeah. Um, children obey your parents and the Lord you Exactly, exactly. And y'all have got the obey thing down, right? So he does want you to obey him, but he wants you to worship him. He wants you to do things for him. He wants you to come to church. He wants you to come to Sunday school. He wants you to sing like you did this morning. And as a matter of fact, he doesn't want you to stop that. He wants you to sing uh, and sing praises to him. Do you know how, like, uh, you had the people from the choir that came up, you know, when the service started? And we had maybe 15 people that came up that were singing praise to him. That's, that's being on mission for him. They're, they're, they're using their voice to sing. Only thing is, sometimes we forget about that mission. We have other missions that we have in our life, and it's going to happen. These people out here will tell you, has anybody here ever been so caught up in your mission that you didn't do God's mission? Anybody? Raise your hand so they can see. Look how many of them, you see? So this can happen to you when you get older. What you need to focus on is being committed to whose mission? Your own mission or God's mission? God's mission. His mission is for you to be able to not just learn about Him, but go out and tell other people about Him. You're supposed to represent Him as you go to school, as you play on your team, as you go to church. You're always on a mission for God. Always. And he'll give you things to do. But the difference about God's mission is he'll always let you accomplish that mission. All right. So let's pray. Lord, I love you. I praise you. And I thank you, Lord, today for just these children who are so open, open and receptive to your word. I thank you, God, that you, you use them to minister to us. Thank you, Lord, for letting them not have the inhibitions, letting them be free to praise you. 
And I just pray, God, that as you put them on mission, as they come and accept Jesus as their Savior, Lord, as they reach that age and you put them on mission, that you would strengthen them to, to take care and accomplish the mission you put them on. In Jesus' name, amen. Now listen, I've got two things today to give you. I brought you something special, okay? Yes, I did go to Nicaragua. I went on a mission trip, but I didn't bring you candy from Nicaragua because our candy is better than their candy, so I wasn't going to bring you something like that, but I know that one of your favorite things is candy, right? So I happened to be uh, Friday evening. I went by a store that had what I think is one of the best candies you could ever, you could ever eat. No, this candy, um, you get it up at, at a place called the Mass General Store. It's up in Boone. And they have some candies that we had when we were growing up and nobody was concerned about sugar or gluten or <laughs> anything like that. And so that's when you really had candy that tasted good. So I picked some up because I can remember when I got a piece of this candy when I was young and I put it in my mouth, it was almost like a flavor parade. Uh, what happened was all of a sudden all these things in my body just started moving better and my mind started working better. And these old people will probably recognize this candy. Has anybody ever seen this piece of candy? All right, breathe, breathe, breathe. I heard all the gasp right there. Any adult ever seen this piece of candy and enjoyed that piece of candy? Huh? Huh? This is one of those things. The, the, guy that dis, the guy that created this should have a day. <laughs> a day in the year. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, because what happens, let me see, adults again that love this thing right here, let me see. All right. Anthony, come here a second. Now, I just didn't want to get you a little piece of candy. I wanted to get you this piece. I want you to watch what happens. Watch. There's something, there's something magical that happens when you put this in your mouth, the whole thing, right? And chew it. But I'm not telling you to put the whole thing. As a matter of fact, I do want to tell you, parents, you're not allowed to eat this unless you eat it in front of your parents, okay? All right? So you can't eat it by, you don't sneak off and eat it by yourself because you want to make sure somebody is with you. Anthony. Now just watch Anthony as he eats this piece of candy. These are my favorites. Absolute favorites. Miss Kelly right now is saying, why didn't he call me? Just eat it. Just, just eat it, Anthony. Mm. Just eat it. I want him to see. Mm. It's almost like that white turned to liquid immediately mm. and it just went mm. and, and went in every little part of your mouth. Does that make you want to raise your hand? Mm. Hey. <laughs> and that's what I've got you guys, okay? So, anybody excited about that? Sugar, 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 right? All right, so I'm going to give you one of those and one pack of gummies. Now, you can't eat either one of them in church. You know that, right? Especially this. If you eat this in church, what I hear is that all your teeth will fall out at one time. <laughs> it's hard enough to grow them. Right? You're just now getting them. You don't want them all. But you eat this under the supervision of a parent, all right? And if they want some, you can either give them some or let them see you enjoy it or whatever. But I got this for you guys, all right? All right. So, come on up. I'm going to give you a pack of each. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Can I have this for my You're welcome. Are you excited about this today? Now, after your lunch is the best time to eat it, okay? But make sure you're sitting down when you eat it. Just enjoy yourself. You. All right. You're welcome. You're welcome. You. You're welcome. You. You're welcome.
Here you go. You. You're welcome. You. You're welcome. You. You're welcome. Kelly, you want one? There's four left. We'll be bidding those off at the end of the service. So. How many people have your Bible today? If you have your Bible, stand and raise it above your head and bear witness of God's word. Amen. Most important thing, most important tool you can have with you. If you have your Bible, open it to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. When you find your place, say, I have it. Acts chapter 9. And once you find your place in Acts chapter 9, we'll have a brief reference in Acts chapter 22. So Acts chapter 9 and Acts chapter 22, right there together. This past week, I was on, on a mission trip to Nicaragua, R- returned from there, and realized I'm, I'm back at home, things are different. But while I was there, I feel like the Lord spoke to me in a lot of different ways, and I think He helped me uh, more than I was able to help anybody there. That's what happens when you go on mission. You, you get on a mission and you realize if you're doing it for the pe- purpose that the Lord has you doing it for, as much as you think you want to help somebody else, you're actually helped. So I was able to get a new perspective on a lot of things in my life. I was able to think past the surface on a lot of things, and I think sometimes we don't think past the surface. And the one thing that I can tell you is that when you, when you have a missionary that is serving somewhere, and that missionary is serving the way they're supposed to be serving, That missionary is a busy person. That missionary has something planned every day that they're going to do, and they have a reason and a purpose. And I can tell you that the predominant thought that was in my mind after the first day that I was there, and of course I was the person that was always asking, okay, what about tomorrow? What are we going to do tomorrow? What are we going to do this evening? Because I'm that person that is used to to saying, okay, this is 9 o'clock, this is 10 o'clock, this is 11 o'clock, by 1 o'clock I need to get this done. Anybody in here like that? And I realized every day that I'm at home, it's like I'm on a mission. Have you ever had that phrase and you thought, okay, hey, I'm on a mission to do this today, or I'm on a mission to do that. Anybody ever have that? Are you that kind of people? And I realized in the the same way, I I was down there on a mission trip, but I was on a different mission. That mission was being told to me by by Brother Donnie. And, And I do want to say that if you've ever wondered, are we supporting a missionary that we need to be supporting? The answer is absolutely, unequivocally, yes. They are on a mission every day. The mission was determined whether we were going up to to buy a bunch of rice and beans and divide them to give them to the poor, or whether they're walking through the villages to go into the houses to be able to witness to people, or whether we were standing in the park and giving out tracts, or whether we were preaching at another church, or we were preaching at a school, or we were sharing the gospel, or leading people to the Lord. We saw a, over 100 people get saved. And no telling how many lives were rededicated to the Lord in the church, man. The church, they were so thankful that we gave them the monetary funds to build this church in a, in a place that, where you had normally 40 people meeting under this outside shelter that had palm fronds on it, now had a church. And on the day that they, they were going to uh, have the, the ordination service of the church and they were going to have the opening service, on that day, 200 people came out from the village. And there was no prompting them to praise the Lord because they were praising the Lord. They were verbally praising the Lord. They didn't care if the person beside of them saw them verbally praising the Lord. They had something to praise the Lord about. They weren't thinking about what was on their mind as far as their 401k. They weren't thinking about which car they wanted to get. As a matter of fact, they walked 
through the mud to get there. They weren't thinking about where they were going to go eat afterwards. They weren't thinking about the different things they had in that day or the leisure that they were going to take part in. They came to worship. Why? Because well, they didn't have the things that we have. Well, so it wasn't a distraction. What they had that day was they had value. Why? Because they were going to go to a place and God thought they were valuable enough that he was going to meet with them that day. So they had value. Their value wasn't in everything that made them who they were. Their value was in that, hey, I may not have anything, but I'm a child of God. And so whereas I sat and Curry and Brian and we thought, man, it'd be nice to give them this or give them that. Why give that to them? Somebody's given it to me and I'm not happy. Nobody gave it to them and they are happy. Makes you think, doesn't it? And all my life I've been on a mission to get and bear in mind, good missions. I want to get for my family. I want to get for my wife. I want to get for this. I want to, I want to be able to, to have this mission in my mind. But what I realized is that so many times, my mission and God's mission collide. And there are people here today that are emotionally distraught right now. There are people that are listening today that are going through emotionally hard times. This isn't working out, whether it's a marriage or whether it's parenting or whether it's a job or whether it's financial or whether it's health. And the sad thing is, it's like this mission that I've been on, it, it just seems fruitless and it's not working. And that's really why all our sadness comes. It's because the mission that we're on, our own mission, is just not working out the way we want it to be. That's where sadness comes in. And it can be an everyday thing. This mission that I'm on today to accomplish this, if it doesn't accomplish, or, you know, you ask somebody, how's your day? Whew. Man, I don't want to have this day. I'll be glad when this day is over. Why? Because the mission you set forth at the beginning of the day didn't work out the way you wanted to. It could be a trip across town, or it could be something that you wanted to do. But understand something, God's mission will always be worked out by God. God's mission will always be accomplished. And I began to think, I would do better as far as happiness, peace, and joy if I was absolutely sure that I was on God's mission, not mine. I have a track record of my, my mission being something that brings me anguish and thought and anxiety. What about you? So I read today about who I think, if I would look in the Bible and I would think, who would I say in the Bible outside of Jesus? What man in the Bible? Would everyone say he was on a mission from God? Who would it be? It would be the Apostle Paul. And so, as I looked at this and God was developing this sermon, I'm thinking to myself, well, let me just see what his order to mission was. So when you go back and you read the 27th, uh, 22nd chapter of Acts, you find Paul giving a testimony. And he's giving a testimony to not a friendly crowd. He was giving a testimony to a crowd that was wanting to kill him. And he was said, hey, hey, Mr. Uh, Policeman, can you stop here? The captain of the guard is, he said, I need to tell everybody something. So he stood up and he gave his testimony. And in that testimony, verse 15, he was talking about explaining what happened on the day that God called him to salvation on the road to Damascus. Now, how many people know the story about God calling Paul to salvation on the road to Damascus? Raise your hand. So, so a lot of people know about that. If you don't, we're going to read about it. But see, verse 15 of chapter 22. This is what Paul said that God said to him. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. What a short little verse. Thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen, seen and heard. You say, well, it's got to be more complicated than that. It is not. To be on mission for God means that you are a witness unto all the people that you happen to be around your people groups about what you have seen and heard. Well, what have I seen and heard? You see, Paul had an experience on the road to Damascus. His experience was that he was on his way to kill Christians and persecute Christians. His name was Saul. 
He was a religious person, but he hated anybody that followed the way of Jesus Christ. He believed that the Mosaic law had to be followed. He was a student of that law. He was a Pharisee. And he believed that anybody who accepted Jesus, which they called the way, needed to be killed or persecuted because they were hurting the church. So he had letters from all the religious leaders and, and from the, the people of high authority to go and find Christians that had left Jerusalem and go and hunt them down and kill them and, and, and be able to lock them up. Men, women, didn't matter. But on his way, Saul experienced God. Jesus appeared to him. So I want to read to you Acts chapter 9. And I want you to see the conversion of Saul, who we know as Paul. And notice here, the one thing I want you to pick out, we could, we could preach for days on this, but we're not. The one thing I want you to notice here is that God had chosen Paul to be on a mission for him. Acts 9. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. And he desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, that's the way of Jesus, whether they were men or women, that he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And, the trim, and, and he fell, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told there what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they did lead him by the hand. And they brought him to Damascus, and he was there three days without sight, neither did he eat or drink. Now, this happened to Paul. He experienced Jesus on the road to Damascus. Jesus spoke to him in an audible voice. There was a light that shined. Paul was left blind. People had to lead him. He was stopped from all the things that he could do and all the things that could distract him, and he had to be focused on God. God, what can I do? What can I do? And God said, I've prepared a man. His name is Ananias. And Ananias is the one that we don't talk about a lot, but Ananias was a Christian man that God had spoken to and said, hey, listen, there's something that I'm working on way over here that I need you to go and work on. I need to send you on a mission, Ananias. We start thinking about Paul's mission, and we have to, to remember, Ananias was sent on a mission inside of Paul's mission. Listen. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, behold, I am here. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth and has seen a vision, a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive sight. Then Ananias answered and said, Lord, I have heard many, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to the saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. God needed Ananias to be on mission so that Paul could begin his mission. So Ananias, when he heard about his mission, he did what we do. He said, oh yeah, I'm familiar, God, with this man named Saul. He's the one that has authority to kill people like me. He's the one that's been going and, and throwing people in jail and, and, and binding them. He's the one that is persecuting everybody that believes like me. I, I know that he has authority. You want me to go to him? You're saying you want me to go to him? That is the mission? It's almost like Ananias was, was trying to remind God about these things as if God didn't know. You say, how could Ananias do that? How can we do it all the time? God tells us what we need to do on our mission and then we remind God the obstacles that we can't get over. When God says, go and witness to someone, and we say, well, you don't understand, I can't do that at my work, or that person, won't, he'll refuse me, or she'll refuse me, or they're going to think I'm going about it a different way, God. When God leads us to do something, we remind God, hey, there's a better way, God. Don't we? Oh, we're not just going to talk about Paul's mission today. We're going to talk about us. You realize that every one of us that have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ are on a mission? I want you to read what God said back to Ananias. He described Paul's mission. And this verse, this verse stands out to me 
It basically dictates what every child of God, everyone who's accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, this is your mission. Are you ready? Are you ready to receive your mission? Listen. But the Lord said unto him, go thy way. Let me translate that. Get to getting. Why are you still standing here? Why are you giving me excuses? Why are you saying this won't work? All that right here. Go thy way. Go. Quit telling me why it can't work. For he, he's going to speak about Paul, is a chosen vessel unto me. If he's a chosen vessel unto God, who does that mean chose Paul? God. He is a chosen vessel unto me to do what? Here's the simple mission that Paul was on. You say, well, Paul had a, a many faceted mission. I mean, he went all the way from, uh, you know, we read the book of Romans and Corinthians and, and Galatians and Ephesians and, and Philippians and, and Thessalonians and first and second Timothy. And, and we see all these things and we see, okay, Paul was on a mission that you could state in one sentence. Yes, listen, this is how easy it is. He's a chosen vessel unto me. Why? To bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel. That was his simple mission. What do you mean? To bear his name. Well, I heard about when Paul was in prison and the prison doors flew open and the jailer got saved. Yes, what was he doing? Bearing his name. I heard about when Paul went to the, the church at Ephesus and people were saved and the church came and, and they gained strength. Yes, those were the Gentiles. What did Paul do? He went bearing Jesus' name. I heard about when Paul stood in front of those Jewish people and he shared that there's a new way. What was he doing? He was bearing his name. Or what about when Paul stood in front of King Festus? He was bearing his name to kings. God knew already that Paul was going to stand in front of Gentiles, kings, and Jews. And do what? Is it complicated? No. He was going to bear his name. What does that mean? He was going to represent him in what he did and what he said on his mission to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. This amazing God that we serve already knew that he would send Paul to represent him to all these groups. God said, he's a chosen vessel to me to bear my name. We may say, well, Paul or Saul, and I may refer to him as Paul or Saul. Please, if I refer to him in the wrong context at the wrong time, don't get your mind stuck on that, okay? I'm just going to say Paul or Saul. His name changed to Paul. He was unique in the fact that God chose him to bear his name. We think about Paul. Paul was really unique in that. No, Paul was not unique in that. Because you are all chosen. I am chosen to bear his name. Paul is unique in the way he carried out his mission. Do you realize that every person in here that is a child of God, that has accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, that at some point in time heard God call out to them and say, hey, listen, I love you, and you're not with me. You've never accepted my son Jesus. Maybe you've, you've been at a church service, maybe you heard it from somebody, and you realized I'm lost. Has anybody in here ever realized I'm lost? I hope so, because nobody can raise your hand and say I'm saved unless you realize I'm lost. And when you realize you're lost and you're separated from God and you realize I need to ask God to forgive my sins and I need to cry out to him and say, I believe that Jesus is my only way to you, God. I believe he died on the cross for me. I believe his blood is the only thing that can cover my sins. I am a sinner. Please forgive me. I want Jesus to take my sins and cleanse my sins. I want to come to you, God. I want him to be my savior. At that point in time, you experience God and you respond to God. That is your road to Damascus. That is when the light comes on. That is when you see the light. So you experience God at that time, and in the same way as Paul, God says, you are a chosen vessel to me to bear my name. You say, well, am I, am I a chosen vessel to bear his name to the Gentiles and the kings and the Jews? Let me tell you who you're a chosen vessel to bear his name to. Every person in your people groups that you come in contact with. I will guarantee you we could bring every person up on this platform this morning and every person could stay a different people group. There is not one identical person in this room that is identical in your people groups with someone else. 
Some of you interact with someone that someone else does it every single day. That is your people groups. That is who you are sent to. We're all on a mission if we've experienced God by salvation. I guess it would be a good time to give you the definition of mission. The definition of mission is an aim in life arising from a conviction or sense of calling. An aim in life arising from a conviction or sense of calling. You may have said before, I'm on a mission, meaning my focus is on achieving this certain thing. Has anybody in here ever used that phrase or use it quite often? Hey, listen, don't bother me right now. I'm on a mission. Anybody? Of course. And then there's some of us. You realize now, and I've told you this before, the reason you get a message preached to you is because God just keeps preaching it to me. And as I, I watch down there, then be on mission for these people of Nicaragua. I began to think about my own mission. I began to think about my mission to him now. And then I began to think about my time since I've been a Christian. If I experienced God and became a Christian at an early age, and then I tell you, well, there's been a time where I wasn't serving God. I wasn't obeying God. I was away from God. Understand, I need to, to put that in a box and be able to describe that as a time where I was not on mission for him. I was on a mission for sure. I'm that kind of person. You may know that. And then you may be that kind of person. I tell you, when I get that daily planner out and I check it off and I have my times there, I need to see this and this and that. And then it changes. And it used to be not as difficult because we didn't have the cell phones. We didn't have as much communication. And even when we had the bag phone, man, the bag phone, at least you had to go out and you do remember the bag phone, right? It wasn't like it added 20 more things for you to do during the day. You could get up and say, this is what I'm going to do. And you wouldn't realize till the end of the day, oh, yeah, well, somebody needed me to do that. Now you know, right? So how many people are on mission? Man, i got to fix this thing. Or some other kind of mission. Listen, I'm going to get up today, and I'm going to get this done. Anybody in here bad to do that? And you can't rest your mind until you get that mission completed? And God forbid anybody interrupt that mission? And some people are on, on this life mission, this, this mission to get physically fit. Let, let's just use that for an example. Somebody that's on a mission to get physically fit. Anybody ever been on that at one time in, this, in their life? I say at one time. <laughs> Why? Because that's a mission that's aborted sometimes. But what do you have to do if you go on that mission? If I were to tell you, I'm on a mission tomorrow to get physically fit. I need to change some things, right? I need to, to go to the gym, not just think about going to the gym. I would need to eat healthy, not just say, today's my last day, I'm going to eat like this and tomorrow, right? I would actually have to do something, right? To be on mission, I would have to do something. What about the person that's on a mission for a higher education? They spend years and years on this mission. It starts in, in elementary school. And they do all their work to get to the next class so that they can get to that class and make the grades and get to the next class and get to middle school and then get to high school and then get to the college. Why are they doing that? They're on a mission to get that education so that education can take them to a certain place so that education can reward them with this that can get them a job. And, and at the end of that job, they're supposed to go out and, and be able to get this job that provides them this adequate financial security. And, and so... The mission goes from the time they're little, and we even teach that as parents, right? Hey, this is why you need to do this. You need, and we put our kids on mission, don't we? We put them on education mission, put them on success mission, put them on financial security mission. We do that, right? I'm not preaching against that. Before you get mad at me, I know when the net goes back like this, and it's like, <laughs> I want my kids to succeed. Okay, me too. I think you should teach your kids things like that. Maybe we're on a mission right now to get a better job so that we can, we can have more secure things. So we're on a mission to look for opportunities. That's what we're putting ourselves in. Or maybe our mission is just to be more financially secure so we, we go out and we work harder. We work more. We implement a plan that will help us make more and invest money into things that we think will make us more. And it's our, it's our mission at the end of the day or the end of the month. We look back and we say, okay, I've accomplished this. At the end of the year, we look back and say, okay, I accomplished it. We grade our mission, don't we? Or maybe we're in a mission to find someone that we can have a relationship with. I know a lot of people are on this mission. A lot of young people, they are on this mission. 
If they're not married, they're on a mission to be a part of a friend group. They're on a mission to be a, a, a part of, of a relationship with either a, a, a young man or young woman that, that they can say, okay, I'm in a relationship, and they hope that that grows to, to marriage, a husband or wife, but, so they're on a mission for that. That means that what they're doing, you say, they aren't really on missions. Then why do they get up and prepare themselves with makeup or wash themselves or put that cologne on that smells like that or, or want to fix their hair a certain way? Why do they do that then? For them? No. You're on a mission to be accepted by somebody, right? We're all on some sort of mission. And then there's the many missions. Ah, oh, the many missions our everyday tasks that we need to complete. They're not these big, year-long missions that we have. They're the many missions. You know, I've got to get up in, in today's society. I've got to get up and, here, let's, after I make breakfast, I've got to get the kids to school, and then I'm going to pick them up at a certain time. And No, I can't pick them up. Why don't you go pick them up? And when you pick them up, you need to take them here because one's got this tonight and the other one's got this tonight. And listen, the, when the games start, we're going to have to do this and this, and we're going to have to be able to take them back and forth here. Hey, did you go and get this? And they, they just told me tonight that they need something for school tomorrow, so we've got to run out and do this, and we've got to help with homework. And So we're on a mini mission every day. Does that sound familiar? Well, let me tell you, when they grow up, you're still on many missions. It's like what we do. And in the stress of many missions is where we seem to break down. Our everyday many mission, whatever it is today. Yours may be different than mine. Right now, you said in your mind before you came in here, we're going to come to church today. We should get out about this time. Up, oh, you found out in the middle of right when you got here, you said, hey, we have deacon ordination. I heard him said it. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> You're smiling. I read you whenever I said it. <laughs> I knew before I said it, and I knew where to look in here. You know what you said? Oh, no. Deacon ordination. That's when they take them up and pray. It's going to mess up. Why? Because you've got a mission to be here. You're going to leave here. You've got somewhere to go, and you want to get going from there. Then you go from this place. Amen? Because we put ourselves on mission. Now, I've stated that it's, it's a clear thing we're on mission for God, but I do want to state this. The thing that I think that keeps us from being able to see God's mission accomplished so many times is that we, we seem to put our mission in front of God's mission. We make our own mission a priority, all the while saying and claiming that we're a child of God, that we're living for Him. Like to live for God, to say, I'm living for God, that means you're on His mission. Now, I could more honestly say, I'm living for Mike. I'll just preach to me. But if I'm on God's mission, I need to be living for God, right? If we're truly living for God, then we're on a mission for Him. There's nothing wrong with us being on a mission for these other things. So don't leave here today. If you leave here today and you say, and this is, your, this is a defense mechanism, so I'll go ahead and warn you, this is, the, is what the devil will use on you. Yeah, he's saying that I can't go about my everyday business. I mean, I got to work. Maybe he's already said it to you. I got to work. I got to do all those responsibilities that will come with parents. I got to do all these things. So yes, that is my mission. I've got to do it. I agree. You do have to do it. Here's what I want you to understand. There's nothing wrong with a mission to be a parent that provides for their children or a child that takes care of their parent, or a person who wants to find a wife or husband, or a person who wants to earn more income or get more education or be more financially secure. But when that mission is put before God's mission, then you are on a mission for yourself, not God. At best, we just try to work His mission into our mission. When you start changing your mission for God and what you know He would have you to do, to make sure your mission works, you are working your mission, not his. I know. I was on mission for Mike for years, and at any given day, I can slip back into that mindset. I'm not preaching to you as one that is over you, who is immune to this. I'm preaching to you as a human being, a child of God, that the devil tempts in every way for me to slip back into my many missions every day. It's easy for us to get distracted by our own mission or mini-mission. 
For example, think about that parent today, that Christian parent that's on a mission to provide for their children, which is absolutely what they should do. They get so caught up in their own mission to give their children what they need or want that they become either too busy or too unfocused to realize that the thing that they need the most is to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ. The children are given everything that you could ever imagine that good parents would give, but it's not anything any different than non-Christian parents would give. If it's not anything any different than non-Christian parents would give, then are they on a mission for God? Here's the answer. Think about it. No. They're on a mission to be able to give their child something. Is that right? Yes. But do you realize in our own mission, if it comes before the mission of God, if you start putting that mission and saying, I want to give them this and I want to do this for them and I want to make sure they experience this, but you're not putting them in front of God, to hear the word of God, to sing praises to God, to learn what God has for them, to let them be involved in children or youth. If you're not doing that, but you're pressing forth those things that you should press forth, like here's how you be a responsible adult. Here's things that you need to enjoy in life. Here's how to be financially secure. You need to do that, but they all need to be wrapped around your mission to God. If you teach them those things without their mission to God, they'll be like every other person. That doesn't have God. They will grow up and be on their own mission, not God's mission. They will realize, and here's the travesty, even our generation today are guilty of this. We raise a younger generation. We do so much for them that they realize our mission is them. So they grow up incapable of doing their own mission even for themselves, not even in a spiritual way. You ask the employers of today, you ask the ones that are hiring people today and they will be able to tell you the generations that they see, the younger generations that are coming up, they don't have that go get it attitude. They don't have that, hey, I'm on mission to do this and this is what I'm gonna do and this is what I'm gonna do. Why? Because somebody has done the mission for them. If I've got somebody that's on mission for me all the time, I might take a break. But if I know I'm on my mission and I have to stay on it, then I'm gonna work as hard as I can. This is not about your mission at work or your mission for a family. This is about, it's about your mission to God. You see, we get so caught up in our own mission. Even as parents, if these parents are prioritizing God's mission, then they would be simple by definition, bearing his name. Bearing his name. Sounds so simple, doesn't it? There'd be family prayer in the home. The parents would see, or the kids would see their parents going on mission to church. They would know this is what we're going to do. They would see them involved. If they know that they're supposed to sing praises to God, you'd see more than 15 people in a choir of a church of 400. Simple mission. Mission. That's doing something for God, something that, that you know that he would want you to do. They would see the, the praise of God in the home. The, the mission of the home would always be talked about. It's sad to think that even in our mission for God and our mission for our family and our mission for work and our mission for success, do you know the first mission that we give up on is our mission for God? Nothing breaks my heart worse than somebody standing in front of me and saying, listen, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to, to be at church or I can't do this because some other part of my life I've made a decision for or a person I've made a decision with. So you know what you've done? You've given up your mission. You say, well, there's no way that I can do that. And, and, and listen, you don't understand what we've had and I love it when parents of two stand in front of me and say, you don't understand how it is. I'm old, but I had four. I know how it is. I failed at it. But then I saw, I saw what the more important thing, the mission that works, is to put my family on mission, the mission of God. Does it mean that we're perfect? Absolutely not. Does it mean that me and Angie are perfect? Absolutely not. 
But I will, un I will tell you one thing. If the whole family knows in that household the mission is to God, God will help work out all those other little missions. Every other little mission. His mission will always be worked out. So I would pose this question because I pose these questions to myself sitting in Nicaragua and I want to give them to you. What do you think your children would say the mission of your home is? I'll answer that for you. It would be what's talked about the most. It would be the place that you go the most, that you travel the most. It would be the thing that takes priority over everything else. Hey, this is going on. It would be what's the most exciting thing going on. That's the mission of your home. It would be the thing that you always, without fail, give attention to. That's the mission of your home. And think about the people that we're around on an everyday basis. Do you think they would describe us as someone who is on a mission for God or someone who's on a mission for ourselves? How would they describe us? I began to think, how would somebody describe me? You say, oh, you're a preacher, you're this or that. There were times in my life when I will guarantee you that a hundred out of a hundred people would have said, you're on a mission for yourself. And I was a child of God at the time. There are people that God puts in your everyday life that are not just coincidental. I've told you before, I'm a firm believer that God orchestrates things. We've already seen him orchestrate Paul and Ananias, right? Do you realize my junior year, there was a boy that moved to our high school. His dad happened to get a job in town, and they were from up north, so people from up north stood out, Anthony. They talked wrong, <laughs> right? So he said, my dad got transferred down here, and just because his dad got transferred down here, they met with a realtor, and the realtor put him in our school district. And so because they were in our school district, he went to my school. His locker was put right, on, uh, right above mine, so I saw him every single day. So as a child of God, God was orchestrating. You say, he did all that? Don't give yourself so much credit. I'm not. I'm just saying God works that way. He puts the people around the people. Why? Because it was my job to bear the name of Jesus to that young man. And now it's the time when I sit and tell you, so one day at his locker, I shared the love of God with him, and he accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. But I can't say that, because I didn't bear the name of God to him. At the time, I was way too cool to do that. I did not want anyone knowing that I was going to take that kind of stand. I was on a mission for God, just like you are when you accept the Lord. And I was around that guy, just like you are. Everybody that you work around, from your children, to your parents, to your neighbors, to your ball teams, to your dance teams, to your whatever, your people groups. But do you realize I never shared the gospel with him? I had a different reason every day. You say, we probably didn't think about it. No, I was convicted to share the gospel with him, and I didn't. I knew my mission. I knew the way he talked. I knew he was from up north, not saying anything, but they, the, he didn't come from the Bible Belt. I wanted to share it with him. I wanted to let him know, hey, this guy that, that you do look up to, he, he's a child of God. I had an opportunity, young person. You understand me? In your schools, you have an opportunity to bear his name. You're on mission. You're on a mission every day. But my mission was to build my name up, to build myself up, to make sure people thought this of me or people thought that of me. Whose mission was I on? God's? No. I never witnessed to that guy. I never ministered to him. And I have no idea how I would ever find him again. That was one that I did not bear his name to. There are thousands like that in my life. But I don't want there to be none like that right now. I don't want there to be any like that right now. I can look back and say that. Maybe you can look back and say that. But there are people that we're around right now. Are you on a mission to them? Think about it. Do you think these people that you're around in your everyday life, would they describe us as someone who is on a mission for God or ourselves? 
Do they see our priority as our finances or material possessions or our relationship or our pleasures or our hobbies, our physical fitness, our intellectual goals, or maybe we just want to make a name for ourselves instead of being on a mission for God's name? What do they see? What do the people see in you? Do they see you on a mission for him or on a mission for yourself? Remember Paul's mission? God said, he's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings and children of Israel. As the children of God who chose to accept God's salvation, then you and I are no different than Paul. We're chosen vessels unto God to bear his name to whatever group that he puts us into to minister to, whether it be our children, parents, family, husband, wife, friends, group, school, workplace, whatever it is. But yet these other missions I get so distracted and caught up in, you know? And then I watch other people. I watch children who now can make great excuses for their parents. Can you? And it makes sense because that's the family mission. And then at the same time, I find, I look back and I think, I remember praying that all these different things that I wanted would work out. And I still do, don't you? Anybody in here pray for God to do something, make something work out for you? Anybody in here? Then what do you pray about? What do you pray? If you don't pray about it, anybody do that? Yeah. We want it to work out. So I got to thinking, if my mission is not his mission, and I'm praying for it, and I'm pouring my heart out, God, please make this work and make this work, but I can't even work my mission into his mission even as good as I can justify something. Why would God make my mission work out if he knew I was going to put it in front of his? And so I realized how many years that I spent praying for something when God was saying, if I give it to you, it's just going to come between you and me. I look at Jesus, and I know as a child of God, I'm supposed to replicate Jesus' life. And I've talked about Paul. But I want to close by telling you, if you're a child of God and you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've experienced God. It wasn't on the road to Damascus, but it may have been in here. It may have been in your car listening to the radio. Whenever it was that you've experienced God, you accepted his call to salvation. And you were put on mission. When that happens, the indwelling of God happens. Jesus Christ in the form of the Holy Spirit comes inside of you. So that means that we should act like Jesus. Do you realize that Jesus, if there's one thing you can say about him, Jesus was on mission he was on mission. From the time God sent him from heaven to Bethlehem. And when he was 12 years old, I don't know if you remember this, or, or somewhere around that age in Luke chapter 2, verse 49, when it begins to talk about his adolescent years, and they lost him in Jerusalem, and his parents came to him. You know what he said? You've been looking for me? Didn't you know I must be about my father's business? You know what he was saying? Hey, you realize I'm on mission here. Remember the angel? Remember Gabriel? Don't forget, I'm on his mission. How many of us could say, listen, if you want to find me, you'll find me on his mission. But I began to think back. My worry, my stress, my anxiety, my sadness, my discouragement, my depression. Hope it's hitting somebody. All those times came from me not achieving my mission. But every mission that I've been on for God, every mission, God said that he is faithful. He is faithful. Now, during those times, the first mission that I want to give up on is God's mission. I just can't do this anymore. This, th this thing is happening in my life, and this thing is happening in my life, so I just can't do this anymore. Why give up on God's mission? Why not give up on your own mission and enjoy the peace that comes from being in the will of God? He chose you for his mission. You just got to put all these other ones in there with him. You say, well, that's not easy. Right, that's why it's called mission. Mission work's not supposed to be easy. There's supposed to be a sacrifice. There's supposed to be a suffering. And the devil will come to us and he will tell us, you can't do that. You can't sing anymore. You can't serve anymore. 
You can't go over there anymore. You don't need to talk anymore. All he's trying to do is make you give up on the mission you were called to. Listen, if he called you to that mission, he will equip you to that mission. He will let you be able to accomplish it or God isn't God. We decide somewhere in our vast intellect that we should stop doing something on his mission because it's interfering with our mission. I want you to have that in your mind. Remember, this same Jesus said to his disciples in John 20, Peace be unto you as my Father hath sent me. Listen, even so I send you. Who sends you on mission? God sends you on mission. You think about these people that God sent Paul to witness to on his mission, these Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel. The one thing that I know for sure is they all knew that Paul was on God's mission, not his own. Every person that Paul encountered, I'll guarantee you, they would say, that man's on a mission from God. That man's on a mission from God, right? Would you agree? What would people say about you and me if they were to ascribe you? Boy, they're on a mission for their work. They're on a mission for their hobby or, or their activity. Well, they're on a mission for their health. They're on a mission to accomplish this. Would they say, they're on a mission for God? Because that's what you were chosen to do. That's what he would have you to do. But what does he do when he puts you on that mission? God always accomplishes his mission. Jesus continually told us, hey, if you ever get this, if you ever can wrap your mind around this and you can say, God, I want to dedicate myself to your mission. I know I'm weak in this area. God doesn't mind you telling him I'm weak. If you tell him you're weak, you're asking for strength. God, give me strength to be dedicated to my mission for you. Give me knowledge to know when I'm distracted from that mission. If you put his mission first, he will let you accomplish those other things. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things shall be added unto you. There's a priority that comes in the mission. Now, the question today is not, am I on a mission? The question would be, on mission for who? I don't think we have any problem saying our lives are busy. I'm on a mission to do this at work. I'm on a mission to do this as a parent. I'm on a mission to do this as a, as a student. I'm on a mission to this as a teammate. I'm on a mission to this as a child. It's not whether we're on mission. It's on mission for who? And if you leave here today, say, Pastor Mike expects us just to put everything away and all we're going to do is go out here and, and do, no, I'm saying we have many missions working at one time, but the priority mission, if it's to God, you'll start seeing your other missions work out and have peace with those missions. He's going to help me be a better father. He's going to help me be a better husband. Why? Because the part of me that's on mission is selfish to my wife. The Holy Spirit is going to lead me to say, hey, you shouldn't do that. You should think about her more than you. It should help me as a parent to say, okay, you've got a decision. Where does your child need to be and what do they need to know? Hey, this is the most popular thing or this is what God wants you to do. The Holy Spirit teaches and coaches me and you. The question's not am I on mission. The question is on mission for who? Right now, if you're a child of God, a Christian, but you're struggling with everyday peace, you're struggling with discouragement, you're struggling with depression, you're struggling now with anxiety and just irritation every day because things aren't working out, I will guarantee you, you need to take a look at your mission. Because if you go on mission for God and dedicate yourself to Him and say, hey, listen, God, I realize I can get distracted. God knows we can get distracted. That's why He implemented repentance when you come to Him and say, God, I see now. The light has come on. I need to dedicate myself to your mission. God will strengthen you. He will help you. He will encourage you. If you're showing up to do God's mission every day, God will reward you. Will you be challenged? Yeah, don't think the devil's going to go on vacation. The devil's always going to be there to say, stop that, you don't have time for that. I'm here to say, don't stop your main mission to do other missions. Don't prioritize the other missions and box your main mission out. Are you a child of God? 
Did God choose you? Are you a chosen vessel unto him? Then are you bearing his name the way you need to bear his name? Would your family know that you're on mission for him above all other things? Would the people around you know that you're on mission for him above all other things? If you're here today and you've never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you fail to, you will die on mission for yourself. And the wages of sin is death, meaning eternal death. That means eternal death in hell. But God says that his gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. And that's what he will give you today. Jesus Christ died for you because God loved you and wanted you to be with him. He wants to be able to give you a peace and joy that passeth understanding. He wants you to be on mission for him. And he doesn't, he doesn't mean, hey, I want you to get saved and then I want you to go up to the street corner and preach for me. He just wants you to bear his name wherever you go. If he ever gets you to the street corner, then praise God, we need people on him. But you might not be that person. He might need you in your office or in your classroom or at your locker or on your team or to your wife or husband or to your children. If you've never accepted his mission, accept him today. If you have, then today I would ask you, I want you to realize that all your other missions in life that you want to accomplish have to be a part of the mission that God's chosen for you, which is to bear his name. I want you to come today and rededicate yourself to his mission or come to him and ask him to give you strength to carry out his mission. If you're a child of God, you're on a mission. Father, I love you and I praise you and I thank you for this opportunity to share your word. I ask you, God, today just to speak to hearts. I pray, God, today that you would speak so clearly to that person that's listening here today or that person listening, Lord, by way of radio or, or maybe it's a CD or maybe they're on the website, Lord, and they're hearing your word, but you found them where they're at. Lord, you found them on mission to their self. You know how easy it is, Lord, for us to fall on to these kind of situations and get on mission for ourselves. Lord, show us ourselves today. Let us be able to distinguish. Let us answer that question, who we are on mission to. And I just pray, God, that as Christians all over, Lord, that are listening here this today, I pray, God, that nothing stands in their way of coming and rededicating their life to be on mission for you. Not knowing where you're going to send them, Lord, but knowing that you will. Knowing that you'll give them strength, God. Let them enjoy that peace that comes from knowing they're in your will. I just pray this for them today. And I pray, God, that if there's anyone here listening that's never accepted the gift of Jesus as their Savior, I pray that today they would see that God's wanting to choose them they would realize their lost condition and come and cry out to you. I just pray, Lord, for their salvation today. Move in this invitation, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me?
may be seated, please. We have been blessed for the past three years to have deacons that have served so faithfully. I want to take this opportunity to thank the deacons and their wives who have served these past three years. They're ending their term. This is David Klein, Jason Klutz, Rocky Hunsucker, Steve Posick, and David Waller. On behalf of the church, I want to thank you for being on this mission Understand to accept the office of deacon is accepting a mission from God. It's a mission that you're pouring yourself into the church. It doesn't mean you always know what to do. It doesn't mean that you won't struggle yourself, but it means that you're committed to do something and, and to be able to strengthen the church. So I appreciate you doing this. So I, I want to say thank you on behalf of the church. Today we have five deacons that will be coming on instead of them. This is Don Mahaffey, Joey Ridenauer, Scott Leslie, Ron Davis, David Basinger. Um, I know that, um, that some could not be here today on the day that we had to plan this, and some of the ones that are coming off could not be here on the day we had to plan this. Um, but for those that are here, I would like to ask the deacons, um, those deacons coming on, and their wives to please join me down front. David Basinger and Scott Leslie and Ron Davis have served uh, before. They have been ordained by the church before. And, of course, uh, David had to be out of town today on a scout. He's involved with the scouts, and they needed him today and wouldn't be back. And we understood that. And Sabrina, what a blessing. Um, she'll be serving right along with him. So I do want to acknowledge that. And uh, for the sake of not having this stretch out to when everybody uh, didn't have something, David said, y'all go ahead and do that. So I want to say thank you to him. But today, Don Mahaffey and Joey Ridenauer and Jamie and Tracy, I just, I thank them for, for coming today. And as we ordain them as deacons today, um, they're basically repeating the same covenant that the existing deacons will. So I'll ask all the deacons the same question and, um, and go through this ordination service the same way, even though you've been ordained before. There is nothing wrong with committing to the church and answering the question again. The word ordination is the act of setting one apart for a service in an office of leadership in Christian ministry to ordain someone, to say, I'm set apart for this, meaning that God's allowing me to be able to serve in this position, and it's just like a covenant that you would make. In Acts chapter 6, deacons were appointed to the church. It says, in those days when the number of disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. They did not say, Find six perfect men. We've never been able to find six perfect men. And we'll never be able to find six perfect men. As you've listened to the testimony of even these, then you realize that there are things they've struggled with in life. But they're committing to be a part of, of what God has said is important, which is the church body, and to be able to strengthen it. He says, but we will give the, ourselves to continually to prayer in the ministry of the word. Now listen to what happened. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they called Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. Now listen to the result. And the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. The role of the deacon is to be able to minister, to be the hands and feet of the pastors, to be able to help in ministering to the flock. 
to be able to strengthen and help take care of things and be the spiritual leaders. So today, along with these, I would like for all the deacons who are serving at this time, even those who just finished serving, would you please stand at this time? And I'd like their wives to stand with them. The reason I'm doing this is so that you will see that there's a covenant that's been made. It doesn't mean that every day is going to be easy. It doesn't even mean that they'll be able to do what they need to do all the time. It's just that they made a covenant to God to, to be able to take this role on. The devil is going to challenge them. So please be praying for them. The devil wants them to be able to give up on their mission. The devil wants them not to be able to do their mission. And sometimes they have to just develop a, a way to do their mission that best, best helps the church. People are difficult. Even the people they minister to, the sheep, are difficult. Some people want to be called. Some people don't want to be called. Some people want to be uh, visited. Some people don't want to be visited. Some people you can say this. Some people you can't. So everybody has to develop their own way to minister. And I praise God for these men. They're, we're doing it biblically. I praise God for their wives because sometimes the wife can minister in a way that the man can't. And so I just praise God for them. And I want to say thank you to them. You may be seated. To the deacons that stand before me and their wives, you've answered the call and the opportunity to serve in this office of deacon in the church body. Along with that call, you're not asked to be perfect, but you are asked to be faithful. You're asked to be faithful to God. You're asked to, to continually try to be in the will of God. I told you when I spoke to you that the most important things are that you love the Lord, you love this church, and that you love me. And I wasn't trying to be um, cute by saying that. I'm saying we're working with each other. You're working with Pastor Blake. You need to be able to love him. You need to be able to go out and minister it's a humbling thing whenever you think about where God brought you from. So today, I value you and I value your wives. Your wives will be able to reach and touch people. They're a person of support. There are things when I talk to you and share with you that your wife will go alongside with you. She's a valuable, valuable person in your life. So my prayer is for both of you together. I offer my thanks, but my prayer is for both of you together. You've answered the call and opportunity to serve in this office of deacon in this church body. The church has prayed and elected you as deacons in this church body of Christ. What I would ask you today is, do you promise to this body of Christ and to God to serve in this role continually, strengthening yourself spiritually with faithfulness to God and this whole church body, looking to God always for your direction? Do you promise to do this? Don, Tracy, do you promise to do this? Joey, Jamie, do you promise to do this? Ron, Scotty, do you promise to do this? Scott, Debbie, do you promise to do this? Amen. And we're grateful. The church is grateful. And the blessings that God would have, I pray his blessings on you. I pray that he gives you wisdom, he gives you strength, and he gives you patience to be able to uphold what he's asked you to do. He didn't ask you to come into this perfect and there's going to be times that you're going to be challenged. So I would like to pray for you. And then after I pray for you, the Bible says that they came and they laid hands on them and prayed for them. After I pray for you and we have you sit up here, then I would ask any deacon or ordained minister now that wanted to come by and pray for them to come by and pray, realizing, realizing the sensitivity, knowing this is a reverent time of our service, Realizing that some are here, that, that, um, that this is new to them. I'd ask you to be appreciative of the time that you have. We're not asking you to stop by and pray a dissertation over them. We're asking you to stop and just ask God to anoint them. Ask God to be able to strengthen them. and Ask God to be able to, to let them be fulfilled in, in this church and so that they can minister to others. So... As a church body, I want to pray on behalf of our church body. Father God, I love you, I praise you, and I thank you for this time that we get to have these stand in front of us. 
I thank you, Lord, for sending these men and their wives to us. I pray, God, on behalf of the church, that you would use each man to strengthen. Use each man, Lord, to educate. Use each man to show compassion and patience. Use each man to minister. And Lord, not just the men. Their wives are so valuable. I pray, God, that you would use their wives as mighty women of God who can always represent you. And Lord, more than anything, that they would be on mission for you. And they would be on a mission, Lord, to strengthen everyone's relationship here at Nazareth Community Church and our church to the community. That we would lead others to you and that this body would become stronger and grow, Lord, not just in knowledge, but grow in favor towards you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'd ask you at this time, there's going to be some chairs that are provided for you, and I'll ask you to be seated instead of kneeling. So if a couple of the other deacons can come, we'll set out eight chairs right down here, and then we'll start a line that's coming up this row right over here. If you'd like to start a line of who wants to come by and pray over them, we'll come by and pray over them. At the conclusion of this, I'll close the service, and we'll have our benediction.
This morning we've done as the Lord commanded us to do. We follow his word for our, our roadmap and our, our blueprint. Today realize I, I appreciate your patience in being able to stay in here, uh, to be able to go through this service. I know it was extended. Uh, we made provisions to uh, maybe make it shorter and, and this and that. And, uh, and so we just follow in the Lord's plan and his mission. Uh, realize, though, the importance of this. These deacons and their wives, when they're assigned families, and if it's your family, the one commitment that they're committing to, above all, is to make sure that every single day they pray by name for you and your family. Every deacon family they have. Your child is getting prayed for. You're getting prayed for. Your marriage is getting prayed for. Um, so understand, it's a big deal. We need to make sure that our prayers are over these men and their wives. So I thank you for being patient today. Uh, I won't keep you any longer. I do invite you to come back this evening. Uh, we'll be having a service tonight at 6 o'clock. Looking forward to that. Uh, Brother Scott and Debbie and Rachel and Angela and uh, Lily and uh, Joyce is not going to be with us tonight, but they're going to be sharing their uh, mission trip um, that they were on. So looking forward to that. So please come tonight. Awanas are tonight, so please come and be a part of that. Any other announcement before we leave? Anybody? If not, Greg, will you dismiss this in prayer?